Hare Krishna. Welcome to this talk on spirituality and medicine. So here is the overview. We will discuss this in three broad sections. What, why and how. So what is the correlation between spirituality and medicine? That will be the first part of the seminar. Second will be why is there such a correlation? And in that we will look at some scientific understandings which have more or less become mainstream and some scientific understandings are on the cutting edge of science and some scientific and some logical rational understandings which are not yet uh, within the purview of science. And then after we discussed what and why then we will discuss how. How does this knowledge of the correlation between spirituality and medicine have a practical application on our lives? So within the what, well, the first thing we'll discuss is how at the turn of the previous century, I mean at the start of the 20th century, there was a overall negative attitude towards religion and anything spiritual and how consistent research for over a century has changed that perspective. perspective. And uh, especially we'll focus on the Handbook on Health and Religion and what it says about uh, this particular subject. Then in why there is such a correlation, we will discuss about how emotions have been found to affect our enzymes, our hormones and through that effect on the physiology, how they are affecting our health, how this has been a more or less well documented fact. And then after that, some surprising finding from the, uh, the start of the century or late of the 20th century is that the emotions can affect not just our physiology, but also our anatomy. Just even the structure of organs and the structure of an organ like the brain can change because of one's thoughts, one's thoughts and one's beliefs. And then why does this change happen? For that we will look at a Vedantic model of mind-body interaction and therein we'll see how the explanatory value of this model uh, based on looking at near-death experiences in which the blind were able to see and also in which a person who was on the verge of death, this person is one among many, who was on the verge of death because of incurable cancer was miraculously cured. And then we will discuss how does this knowledge of the correlation between spirituality and medicine affect us. By us there can be two categories, there are the caregivers and the care receivers. The caregivers can refer uh, not only the doctors, the nurses, but also the relatives of the patients and how they can be sensitive to and supportive of the beliefs of their uh, care, objects of care. And then we'll look at the patients and how they can get a sense of purpose and uh, purpose to living and passion to healing by spirituality. So let's begin. Now, the, at the start of the 20th century, this is slide two, uh, 20th century, the idea was that science and religion were at war. And science was winning and religion was losing. Now, the words religion and spirituality have some relationship and some difference between them. Um, I will focus on one particular model here, wherein spirituality has two limbs. There is, science, uh, there is philosophy and there is religion. Just as science has two limbs, science has theory and science has experiment. So philosophy, the wisdom within spirituality refers to the th theory of science. And religion is the practical what to do's. That correlates with the, with the application, the experiment, the field studies, the lived aspects of science. So in that sense, religion and spirituality are not uh, entirely separate items. They are integrated items, uh, they, are, they are connected items. 
so here in the seminar we will use them interchangeably although the world has a world religion has a negative connotation but religion cannot be entirely divorced from spirituality uh, so here we'll focus on the general attitudes towards religion the word spiritual became mainstream especially after the 1960s when there was the countercultural revolution in america and uh, that was the time when sbnr spiritual but not religious that sort of ideas became more very common and thereafter that trend has spread all over the world also so right now we are discussing about a time when the word spiritual was not yet cool and religion did not the word religion did not invoke such negative connotations but even at that time there was a group of people who considered religion to be like a disease so and these people thought that you know science is the thing that will cure humanity of the disease of religion and uh, even the some of these uh, researchers uh, who somehow using their own models came up with the idea that religion is like a psychosis it's a mental disorder and it needs to be cured by the rationality that is provided by science so this is the science and religion war thesis and both of them are in conflict but surprisingly as the centuries progressed this what was thought to be like a conflict turned out to be a companionship science and spirituality can both promote the human well-being how this can be done and how scientific history uh, has vindicated this idea of a combination rather than a confrontation of science and spirituality that will be the subject of the seminar from the point of view of medicine so since that time onwards uh, systematic studies started in from the 1920s 1930s onwards many systematic studies started about to to examine what was the relationship between religious belief and health where people who believed in god or who went to churches mosques or temples and did some sort of uh, religious activities did they have a better health or a poorer health as compared to others who especially as compared to those who did not do such things who were non believers so the most comprehensive study of the relationship between religion and health was actually a meta study meta study means where many many studies together are brought together and seen in perspective so this was done and uh, published in the title handbook of religion and health by uh, the oxford university press up and now here there were many researchers i mean harold kanig md michael maclo phd and david larson md they reviewed more than 2000 published experiments that tested the relationship between religion and everything from blood pressure heart disease cancer and stroke to depression suicide psychotic disorders and marital problems that means there were two genera there is physical and mental problems so are religious people more suicidal than non religious people or are religious people less suicidal than non religious people so like that it was not just that they themselves did one study there were hundreds of studies done by different people all over the world and not just anybody can do a study but a study that gets published in a peer reviewed journal journal that has its own level of credibility and respectability and like that 2000 studies from all over the world uh, all those published studies they did a meta study compiled all of them and they presented their findings in this book handbook of religion and health and what was their finding they found that people who attended a spiritual program at least once a week lived average 7 years longer than those who didn't attend at all that means just attend uh, if, if if one parameter or one goal of medicine are ultimately to promote longevity one of the branches of medicine which is today alternative medicine ayurveda 
and the knowledge that is meant to increase Ayu uh, Ayu is lifespan, longevity so that is one of the primary goals of medicine and gerontology focuses specifically on that and uh, wherever the average lifespan has increased as compared to the last uh, century last, as compared to the past especially in a few centuries compared with them then that is considered one of the great medical successes so here we see that just attendance participation in the religious pro program once a week that led to an average seven years increase in lifespan imagine if there was some medicine that was known if you take this medicine your lifespan will increase by seven years uh, how widespread how popular how cool that medicine would consider be considered to be so this is a medicine just religious commitment in terms of participation in a program at a temple or a church or a mosque this can once a week this can increase one's lifespan by seven years actually the amount of time one spends and goes to a temple for two three hours two three hours and one does it per year that would work out to be just 150 hours and even if we assume three hours per week and 150 hours is actually nothing compared to uh, 150 hours per year even if one lives for 30 40 years still one spend that much life that's just 6000 hours and actually the amount of hours that one gets one one lives for seven years is far far greater and 24 into 30 into 12 or 24 into 365 into 7 it's a far greater amount so the, in, even in terms of in, in, the longevity of life one gets more than it's like one gets significantly more than one what is investing so now of course the point is not just some mathematical precision over here we will be focusing on the principle not only was the quantity or duration longevity of life improved but even the quality of life was improved by the practice of religion so the quality was improved for youth as well as for elderly people so religious youth showed significantly lower levels of drug and alcohol abuse premature sexual involvement criminal delinquency and suicidal tendencies than their non-religious counterparts so this is a serious problem especially in today's scenario where people are being wrecked by self-destructive behavior by bad habits so what was found that if people were committed to religion then the likelihood that they would succumb to drugs or alcohol or uh, unhealthy sexual behavior and the diseases and problems associated with that and crime and suicide all these were much lesser among youth as are typically the problems when comes comes a teen into adolescence and then youth as the passion of youth the hormones of youth come over uh, people uh, wanted want to go wild and explore the pleasures that are there and it creates a lot of uh, uh, danger and if one wants a protection from that danger this can be a protection uh, dr patrick glean wrote a book called god the evidence and therein he says that there is no better correlate of mental health or no greater insurance against self-defeating behavior than a strong religious faith so again now it is not just for young people there was there were benefits even for elderly people so elderly people with deep personal religious faith have a stronger sense of well-being and life satisfaction than their less religious peers so that means well-being and life satisfaction now, as people grow older one of the biggest problems is feeling of loneliness there is of course the bodily deterioration that happens but along with that there is the feeling of loneliness the feeling of abandonment the feeling of um, useless worthlessness of one's life that can overwhelm a person but people have some religious commitment then this helps them in dealing with that 
and people have a greater sense of not just freedom from negative emotions but well-being and life satisfaction that is better among elderly people so what dr H what was dr harold cunning's conclusion here a high sq faithfulness to god appears to benefit people of all means educational levels and ages so sq refers to spiritual quotient so there is intelligence quotient iq that is emotional quotient eq and the spiritual quotient sq so a high sq faithfulness to god so that appears to benefit people of all means educational levels and ages that this may basically he's saying that this is the conclusion of his studies that uh, this is one medicine that helps everyone is something it's not a necessarily a physical medicine in terms of something that has to be ingested into the body but it is something which has been just to be accepted in one's uh, world view and one's lifestyle and if one does that it benefits everyone it increases the longevity and improves the quality of life so this is the correlation and remember this is not just one study this is the inference from a compilation of 2000 studies and many other studies subsequently have indicated the findings of this particular research again and again where people have religious belief it's found that their overall health is better physically and mentally uh, they are less prone not just to um, self defeating behavior but also to it's found that people recover faster from diseases it's found that people ha uh, overall are uh, quicker quicker from surgery they are less prone to fall pro less vulnerable to diseases and they are more prone to uh, more likely to recover faster from diseases now so max planck made the statement in another context but it is relevant for us here he said for god is at the beginning for science god is at the end now that means that religion begins with the understanding there is a supreme and we need to harmonize with him so for science god is at the end that means science initially had the idea that there is no god and there's no spiritual dimension to human life but now after century after decades and decades of painstaking research it's found we found that uh, living harmoniously with god is actually beneficial for human beings it's beneficial for their health and beneficial for their all around well being so for science god is at the end this is what max planck is saying now he was talking more in terms of uh, physics he's a nobel laureate physicist pioneer in especially uh, quantum physics and uh, other many other uh, branches in physics but what he has said that applies to the findings with respect to religion's effect on human health also now we come to the next point is why does this happen this as we say that if uh, the whole idea of religion and god and something beyond uh, this life it if it were just some belief which people have then why should it uh, it just uh, it's just imaginary belief like a psychosis uh, that people have then why would it have a beneficial effect on people why would it improve one's health so this why we will discuss at various levels so now firstly there are more specified and planned studies done also and then there are retrospective studies in medicine there are prospective studies retrospective studies means that there are people who have already experienced certain things and then uh, they are invited to participate in a study they are interviewed and their reports are compiled together so prospective studies means that a set of people are shortlisted and they are observed and then they are studied generally prospective studies are more reliable than retrospective in medical circle they considered more reliable because in retrospective studies things have already happened and we mostly have to rely on memory and the documentation may not be accurate but in prospective studies because this particular group of people is being shortlisted in advance then all the documents can be kept more relevant documents can be kept more carefully the interviews can be done more carefully and any um, critical or dubious memories 
um, um, uh, conflicting versions of events can be more thoroughly investigated and more authoritatively resolved. So therefore, uh, there have been prospective studies done also on the correlation between, um, between religious practice and health. So among the pioneers of body-mind medicine is Dr. Herbert Benson. Now he, he developed something called a re the relaxation response, which in one sense is nothing but a scientific uh, term for meditation. So relaxation response means that uh, do a particular set of actions and contemplations that brings about the response of relaxation within the body. Now, uh, is, uh, for example, there, there can be something like say focus on some very soothing scene from nature, think of the sky or think of some mountain with very beautiful looking greenery or contemplate on some sacred sound, say whatever the sound that is sacred according to your religious belief. So this was a non-denominational study, non-sectarian study which he had done and he encouraged people according to their beliefs to take up some sound for repetition and for some sight for contemplation. For, and so people, some Christians took up Jesus, Muslims took up Allah, Hindus took up Ram or Krishna or some other names, Buddhists took up Buddha what are the names and he found that during the process of recovery if people were encouraged to do this then their health improved if they were sick they would be become healthier faster now why was this so in one sense this study correlates or confirms what was found by handbook of religion and health but this uh, takes uh, things a bit deeper. Why is it that people are getting cured? So now because it is a prospective study, so not only was the health uh, recovery observed carefully, but also what was happening inside the body was observed. Not just over periods of time, but also con more, uh, more scrutinizingly, more continuously in fact. So it was found that when people meditated on, on something which they considered spiritual, that activated parts of the brain, I'm not going to technicalities over here, but that activated parts of the brain which released hormones that were conducive to well-being and health. So overall, the conclusion of researchers like Dr. Herbert Benson was that by cultivating positive, affirmative, spiritual thoughts, one literally bathes one's body in healing fluids. Now just as if we bathe our body with water, it is a cleansing fluid. So uh, now there are some fluids which, are, which have promote growth, some, uh, some uh, fluids which can promote a cleaning. So if there are a healing fluid, some, some fluids that, come, uh, that promote healing, then actually if something is wounded, we would expose it to that. So, literally, our positive thoughts, positive emotions, especially positive, not just in terms of, I'll be healthy, I'll improve, not just in those terms, but more in terms of focusing on a higher reality. And that, they found, had a positive effect on the health. So, basically, The Power and Biology of Belief was also one of his books. The Power and Biology of Belief. So, Biology of Belief means, here, uh, he is not yet going into the spiritual dimension specifically. What he focuses on is that there is something that happens in the brain. So whatever we think about, whatever we contemplate on, that affects our uh, thoughts naturally. And that leads to certain kinds of chemicals being induced in the body which promote health. So here there is one level of explanation of why we improve, why does our health improve, why, why do religious people have better health than non-religious people, how does religion contribute positively to medicine, that her explanation is that because we secrete enzymes and hormones which promote health. So now uh, beyond this, so this is with respect to physiology, 
But then something more was found, even more dramatic. So Norman Doidge um, was a neuroscientist specializing in neuromedicine. Uh, uh, that means treating people with uh, brain disorders. And he, after many decades of study, research, and uh, experimentation, wrote a book called The Brain That Changes Itself. And in that he says, the idea that the brain can change its own structure and function through thought and activity is, I believe, the most important alteration in our view of the brain since we first sketched out its basic anatomy and the working of its basic component, the neuron. So, the, the idea that the brain can change its own structure and function. So, earlier, what was thought was, this is actually, there was a famous uh, a pioneer of psychology, William James. And it was towards the start of the 20th century, the late part of the 19th century. So, he was one of the first uh, among the medical field who emphasized the power of the mind and the power of thoughts. And what he had thought of, what he had uh, laid the foundation for, was subsequently concluded, confirmed that, you know, by changing our thoughts, we change our life, not just in terms of what we achieve externally, but also in terms of the kind of health that we have. So that was, as I said, one level of, un it's easier to accept that physiologically, Yes, the health inducing symptoms, enzymes and chemicals are induced in the body by positive thoughts. But here what he found was something even more substantial, dramatic even. What was that? So he studied for decades and his book contains many extraordinary stories of personal triumph based on a changing of one's thoughts. So for example, people have some, uh, some problems in their brain certain parts of the brain are not developed, certain parts of the brain are not functional and the brain is such a complex organize, organ, uh, uh, organ that curing it is, is itself a very complex process and surgery is not always advisable because the brain itself is so complex that one can't say what will go right, what will go wrong. So often surgery is quite hazardous and in some cases some problems in the brain are so great that there is no hope for treating or healing them. But he found that by encouraging people to live purposefully, to change the way they think, by to focus on their uh, cultivating a positive attitude, it not only change their uh, change the change hormones or enzymes, but also change literally the neural connections. And the brain itself redesigned itself. This is called neuroplasticity. So plastic, plasticity means changeability, malleability. So the, when the neural connections are not very well developed, then the brain does not function so well. When the neural connections are more well developed, the brain functions even more effectively. Of course, the brain is very complex and what I am explaining is a very, uh, a very reduced and simplified understanding of it, the whole situation. But the simple point is that the whole idea, as I said, that the uh, structure and function can be changed. It is a dramatic idea. And that was what was found here by these scientists. So it was remarkable. Uh, and, now, and now his findings have been confirmed by many other uh, scientists also. And this indicates something deeper. Now how does this happen? We know that if, if I am living in a house, now just by desiring, oh this house has got say green color paint, I don't really like green color paint, I would like a yellow color paint. Just by my desiring, the green paint is not going to change to yellow paint. Oh, or otherwise if I say that, you know, this wall is connected uh, at right angles. I would like to have this wall connected to the ceiling in a more smoothly curving way. That sort of change is not going to happen just by my wishing. But that is the kind of changes that are happening in the brain just by the power of focused intention. So how does this happen? That is something which is uh, one of the biggest unanswered questions uh, with current conceptions of what the body is and what consciousness is. So now to further understand this why, now let's look at the Vedantic model of body-mind interaction based on an independent locus of consciousness.
So here we will see in the Vedantic model our being has three levels. There is the body, there is the mind and there is the soul. So the body is like the hardware. If we compare it with a computer system, so the computer system has a hardware, a software and a user. So the body is like the hardware. The mind is like the software. And the soul, the, uh, the soul word often has religious connotation and religious, term, uh, religious uh, implication. But soul here simply means consciousness, a source of consciousness. That is the user. So now, what does this mean, the user? The person. So the, uh, the, here the point is to understand that there is a matter-spirit duality. That this consciousness is different from matter, from the physical body. And a consciousness, the source, the consciousness is the energy that comes from the soul. The soul is the source of consciousness and that consciousness radiates into the body. So to understand this, let's look at the model now. So here, this is, first we will talk about how this can explain some of the mysterious things that are there, that have been found in medicine and in my medical science and then we'll see how it applies to the broad field of medicine so from the Vedantic model let's see how we function so by considering our normal of uh, normal vision so when we see how do we see that is what is illustrated in this diagram so before we look at this diagram you know when uh, Science magazine published its uh, one of its 125th anniversary issue. So it raised a set of questions, which for which science doesn't have any answer till now. So one of the questions was, what is the biological basis of consciousness? You know, or how are we conscious? So in the magazine, the, ex the example of vision itself was given. So now, when if we say if I see a rose. Then the rose is in front of me and the rays from the rose enter into the eyes and they go from the con through the retina to the optic nerve and they go to the visual area of the brain. And once they go into the visual area of the brain, what after that? Uh, is it that somehow what is externally a rose that is replicated through the connections in the, uh, in the various neurons in the brain? No. How does uh, the... How do the electrochemical rays wave patterns how do the electrochemical wave patterns entering the eyes how do the electrochem electrochemical signal sorry the electromagnetic ray waves entering the eyes and subsequently the electrochemical signals going through the optic nerve and firing through uh, uh, the firing of the neuronal cells how does that lead to something like sight this itself is a great mystery and it's one of the unsolved questions in science so the two problems are there over here and this first is when we see we know that there is there are multiple uh, kinds of input that come in so that means that say uh, instead of if I see a parrot flying by and the parrot is chirping also now at that time I see the shape then I see the color and then I see the motion and then I hear the sound now all these are coming in so the uh, the shape the color and the motion they are coming in through the eyes and the sound is coming in through the ears but all these go through different part to the different parts of the brain even the visual area of the brain the shape the color and the motion are perceived at different places and similarly the sound is perceived at another different place Yet, when we perceive it, we get an integrated perception. So, how is that? This, how does this integrated perception take place? That integrated person that's a big question. This is often called the integration or the binding problem in consciousness. And there are no satisfactory uh, explanations for how the integration takes place. And even if the integration takes place, the, now to understand what is integration means is, suppose in a movie is going on, and if that in the movie the audio and the video are not synced together, say the video is moving faster than the audio, then um, the 
uh, one person, uh, say two people are fighting and one person punches the other person. And now the sound of the punch comes, say the, the punch hits and the person falls. But if the audio and video are not synced together, then the punch comes much later after the person has fallen down. And the person tap, falls and then tap, then one hears the punch. This is stupid. So the, if the audio and video are not synced together, then we cannot release the experience. So similarly, the syncing has to be done inside also, in our brain. So who does the syncing and where is the syncing done? So one thing is that the syncing, the syncing has to be done, the integration from the various inputs has to be done. And secondly, there has to be someone who perceives it. Even if all the inputs are put together on the screen, on our TV screen, still who sees this? Who sees this? that is not known so that is itself also a big question so the Vedantic model explains that the thinking is done in the mind the mind is like a high-tech multimedia computer which integrates all the sensory inputs uh, coming uh, and then presents them for display and response by the soul so just like um, data if a computer is used for monitoring a patient then uh, then the various sensors might be there or to look at the heartbeat to look at the various uh, other parameters the brain waves to look at the blood pressure whatever all those inputs are coming in from different devices and they are put together and the computer in one screen offers the, all the inputs together so that integrated integration function and integrated display function is done by the mind and then beyond that there is the person who is doing the perception that is the soul so that's how we can understand as three level that the body, mind and soul. So the body is the, we have the physical senses. So the body is the primary object for treatment for medicine. Beyond the mind, so whatever is happening in the body, that is integrated in the mind. The mind is not the same as the brain. The mind is subtle, just like there may be in a computer there is a CPU. But the CPU is still a physical part. Whereas the operating system some people may have Unix, some people may have um, Mac OS X, whatever operating system they use. Uh, they, that operating system is not something which is gross. We cannot point out this is the operating system. We may say that in a particular part of the computer, the, the operating system may be uh, stored. But even that is not so precise. The understanding is that it's not that that part is the OS. It's, it's subtle. So like that, uh, the brain is the root R-O-U-T of consciousness. The brain is not R-O-O-T, not the root of consciousness. So coming back to this diagram again, now let's try to understand this, how this happens. How do we normally pursue? That question is unanswered in today's mainstream science, which is largely matter-based. Let's see how spiritual, spiritually-based science can answer this question. So when we observe the outside world, the vision comes in through the eye and from the eye it goes to the brain, from the brain it goes to the subtle eye and from the subtle eye it goes to the soul. That means that it is pursued at that particular point. So the subtle body includes the mind and the mind has its own subtle senses. That's why there are people who in dreams the eyes are closed and they can still see because the subtler sense of vision. So now Dr. Kenneth Ring and several other researchers, they have found that there are, there is, they have used the term called mind sight. Mind sight refers to the capacity to perceive among the blind. That means people who are blind throughout their life. Uh, there are congenitally blind people, there are adventitiously blind people. Congenitally means those who are from birth blind. Adventitiously means those who were, uh, who had eyes but because of accident lost eyes. So now those who are congenitally blind people, they have had no experience of vision itself. And for them to perceive anything is nothing short of a miracle. So they have found that during near-death experiences, near-death experiences refers to the experiences when a person 
is very close to death because of some accident or some heart attack or something like that and during that time when people are in close to that often they have OBEs out of body experiences that means they experience that they have come out of the body and they are perceiving from outside the body so uh, there are several uh, cases which Dr. Ring observed and is documented in a book called Mindsight therein he describes how uh, people, Vicky Winnipeg for example was one case of a person who was blind and the on, only time that this person saw was when, during near the experience so the, person, the patient was unconscious and then at that time the patient reported observing the doctor and the medical staff trying to treat the body the patient's body itself but the patient was observing it from above and the patient could not recognize anyone but uh, Vicky recognized people based on their voices could not recognize because not seeing had never seen but this was the time oh and uh, by being familiar with the voice the patient understood that actually oh this is my doctor this is how the doctor looks like this is how this nurse looks like and then once the near-death experience ended person was no longer able to see now there have been many documented cases of near-death experiences and many researchers have done this but these are the most incomprehensible, inexplicable how can a person see and see accurately so phenomena which are very difficult for the materialistic uh, model of, of for scientific materialism to explain for a science that is open to spirituality has capacity to explain that so how would that be explained? We can understand it here that here there is near-death vision, near-death experience. How is the vision happening at that time? When a person, normally the soul along with the subtle body, that is the mind, we will roughly equate a subtle body with the mind. The subtle body has other components also, but here we will focus on the mind. The soul along with the mind they are present normally inside the gross body but during some bodily rupture during some bodily trauma the soul and the subtle body come out and they can observe from outside the body so, so here we'll see the normal vision is what we see through the eyes but here there is no activity there is no sight uh, the, the brain itself all the windows are flat the eyes are closed now no percept no, no no light is going inside so one cannot see with the gross eye but then there is the uh, there is the soul and the subtle body have come out and the subtle eye sees through the subtle body and then the soul perceives that way so now this may seem a little advanced and complex but the simple point to understand it is it's a sophisticated model of um, mind body interaction and in fact it's not just mind body interaction it is soul ma spirit matter interaction that is being talked about and the mind is the medium through which this interaction happens so <clears throat> now there is also a famous case of ND near the experience with miraculous healing that is the case of Anita Murjani so NDE with miraculous healing so Anita Murjani was a Indian origin person living in Singapore and I was an atheist and so the point of being atheist is that person had no she had no prior religious beliefs that she wanted to confirm by this kind of experience but then she not only had a near-death experience but during the near-death experience she had this near-death experience in which she saw that her doctor is tell uh, she was on the bed about to die and she felt herself floating outside the body and then she came out and she saw the doctor telling her uh, husband that there is n uh, that there is no hope and she's unlikely to live till the next morning her body was she had been taking treatment for several years for acute cancer and uh, it had been declared incurable and therefore she in her desperation was on the verge of death so at that time she not only saw her uh, husband uh, shocked by the doctor's diagnosis, uh, prognosis, but she also saw her brother 
who had boarded a flight for coming to be with her and she had no knowledge that her brother was coming when she had fallen unconscious and then uh, she, she had several experiences after that but apart from but the most important thing is that she came back to consciousness uh, 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 doctors found that her cancer had gone into regression and within just a few weeks a person who was supposed to die was discharged and returned back to a almost a normal healthy living so it is a well documented a case of how a person was miraculously cured so now the question, now if we remain closed dr william james he said that you now when uh, now this is just one case but there are many cases like this where uh, dr ian stevenson wrote a book called a whole book uh, or a whole full chapter in one of his books called paranormal modification of biological form so dr ian stevenson was a was the oh, the pioneering researcher at the university of virginia and department of personality studies he was the head of the founding head of the department and he's a pa paranormal modification of biological form that means how by thoughts one's body can change so here what has been found is that that there have been people who have been declared to be medically incurable and they have been cured now this does this mean that we have to just believe anything and everything and reject medicine no not at all it's not a question of rejection of medicine but this is simply a question of being matter of being open minded to whatever is available for helping in the healing process so rather than letting medicine reduce the healing options we can be open minded to other healing options also now what is the vedantic understanding of how this person was able to perceive or be cured the understanding is that the mind has powers that the body itself does not have because the mind acts at a subtler level so that means that just as we can see in some cases um, a computer uh, which is functioning poorly we may check at one level that okay is some hardware part wrong do i need to increase the ram is the monitor not proper is the keyboard not proper i can check for functional issues at uh, the level of hardware but there can be problems at the level of software and if i update my os at a physical level nothing has changed in my laptop but i may find that oh my laptop's performance has improved much more so uh, when i am as a user working on a machine i cannot reduce my machine to simply its physical structure yes it has a physical structure but along with that it also has a it has physical parts but along with that it has a something which is not exactly reducible to physical holdable tangible components and being open to that is important for me to optimize the performance of my machine for my of my machine similarly it's important for me to be open to higher forms of medication or or other higher forms of healing in addition to physical medication so now these we may say are mystical and that is true that okay this sort of miraculous healings can often happen to some people or because some people may have some near death experiences but uh, what we want in medication is systematic cure that is repeatable what is the use of something which may have happened to someone and even if we are open say okay even if we admit it has happened how does it apply to everyone yes that is a valid question and we are focusing not here on the specific miraculous or mystical cures and not recommending that we somehow try to make them mainstream and reject or subordinate the normal medical process to that what we are talking about is look at the explanatory framework that this uh this world view offers or this conception of the self offers and see how that can benefit the healing process and how that can promote uh, the uh, me medical purpose of being improve of improvement so for example 
Now today uh, when we talk about spiritual health, we are talking about application of carriers. In spiritual health, one of the main things that is talked about, the word spiritual health has become quite mainstream in medicine today. And the main focus on that is that one that the caregiver, the doctors and others should be sensitive to the belief systems of the patients. And that sort of sensitivity is a welcome development given that uh, the world is becoming mul multicultural increasingly. So that is, a, that is a desirable and welcome development. So, uh, so certain patients may be vegetarians and then while giving medicine or while prescribing diet, the caregivers can be sensitive to their dietary preferences as much as possible. That's one level of understanding. But then beyond that there is something more. You know, not just be sensitive, uh, we can be sensitive to many things. You know, certain people like certain things, we are sensitive to them. But we don't consider them as really rational or reasonable. But not only being going beyond sensitive to being supportive. So Carl Jung, as we know, was one of the pioneer psychologists. Uh, and although he was initially um, a protege of uh, Sigmund Freud, later on, and Sigmund Freud started sexualizing everything and started becoming a anti-theistic campaigner, then Carl Jung parted ways and he developed his own sophisticated model of the mind based on archetypes on <clears throat> that's a complex subject but let's see what he has to say on this point of healing and uh, one's uh, spiritual orientation so in his book psychotherapists or the clergy psychotherapists or the clergy chapter 11 he says among all my patients in the second half of life, that is to say over 35, there has not been one whose problem in the last resort was not that of finding a religious outlook on life. It is safe to say that every one of them fell ill because he had lost what the living religions of every age had given their followers and none of them had been really healed who did not regain his religious outlook. So, very profound and direct statement. So, this person who has been offering care and he is saying that, especially in the second half. Now, now why second half? Generally, in youth, the body is healthy and unless one indulges in some self-destructive habits, one does not usually get any major problems. But in second half, the body itself becomes weak and that time, one's vulnerability becomes much more. So he's saying if that, that time as a person becomes older, during that phase for healing to happen is not easy. So how can healing happen at that time? He's describing that at that time the last resort, we can try norms on mainstream medicine, but last resort to find was not that of finding a religious outlook of life. So one who did not have that religious outlook, that's why the book is called as psychotherapist or clergy. That means turn towards God or turn towards psychotherapy. So one has to, yes, one can go for psychotherapy. One can try to psychoanalyze and try to find out what one's problems are. But beyond that, one has to go deeper and understand what is the purpose for which one is living. So now he's not just talking about some dogma which one has to believe but what the living religions of every age have given to their followers. What are the religions, uh, the sense of purpose and meaning for life. What religion does is that it helps us to see our life not just as something which uh, uh, infinity of activity with uh, uh, infinitesimal patch of activity within two inf between two infinities of nothingness. That means I was born at birth, before that I did not exist and then I live for some time, flap around in this bodily bag and then afterwards I die and I am destroyed. So the whole idea that my existence is going to end in nothingness, that is a very uh, debilitating idea. It can demoralize a person and understand, getting the sense of purpose and meaning, that's what living religions do. Living religions are not just meant for uh, you go and say uh, ring a bell or do some kind of religious activity just go in a particular direction or move the hands in a particular way no these are meant to be expressions of something deeper of the uh, 
the purpose that drives one's life and that's what so those who have fallen sick especially in the later years of life he says that only those who got what the living religions of the world had to have were they cured cured and others found it very difficult to cure because they had no purpose to life now this uh, crisis of purpose applies not just to some individual but it applies to society at large so here there is a conversation between two Nobel laureates so Werner Heisenberg is talking with uh, Albert Einstein he is saying this and this has been quoted also by Dr. Abdul Kalam in his book Ignited Minds he says you know in the west they built a large beautiful ship it has all the comforts in it but one thing is missing it has no compass and does not know where to go so we have a large beautiful ship imagine with all facilities but if we don't have a compass we don't know where to go so what spirituality offers us is this purpose to so the western westernization of society in india and the overall materialism that has spread in society that has ripped the sense of purpose away from people's lives and that has left people aimless uh, you know are we just nothing once we remove diverse spirituality from life then who are we what are we are we just particles of uh, matter are we just electrons rotating around aimlessly and endlessly for all our life is is there nothing higher to our life beyond this so this can bring a profound sense of meaninglessness and purposelessness so spirituality brings purpose to life and i'm looking for the let if the purpose to living bring passion to healing that purpose to living bring passion to healing that means if i have a purpose to live uh, then a purpose not just oh i have to do this job or i have to do that have to, a deeper purpose which comes from the innermost core of my being and that matches with the nature of universal reality then that kind of purpose can bring passion yes i want to get cured and then once the person has an inner motivation for recovery doctors know that if a person is demoralized and doesn't want to get cured then medicines can't help the person much to get cured at one extreme there are people who are hypochondriacs who are healthy physically but they pretend to be sick in order to get attention for whatever purposes now nothing can cure a hypochondriac but it's not that people who are healthy imagine to be sick because of a sick mind but a sick mind can also make the body sick and that's what psychosomatic diseases are all about that so negative effect is also there and positive effect is also there in terms of placebo effect you know people are told that you are being treated and if they are being treated the, they even if they are given sugar, sugar pills they get cured because they feel that they are being treated so let purpose to uh, so here what either what is happening the mind is affecting the body this is something which we discussed earlier before of course but here we are focusing on much more that if we if spirituality can bring purpose at the level of the mind which spirituality can definitely do then it can bring a uh, purpose and mission a sense of mission to one's healing also as german philosopher frederick nietzsche he said that he who has a why in life can tolerate almost any how let me now when people are sick say suppose somebody has got cancer and has to go through chemotherapy or radiotherapy now it can be quite uh, agonizing and mortifying Now people lose all their hair and they feel so humiliated sometimes by that uh, the body may get discolored uh, and just the fact that one is sick and one has to depend on others for even one's basic needs uh, it can be very mortifying for people but uh, how, how will i tolerate all this that question can cripple people but if people have a purpose for their life he who has a why in life can tolerate almost any how so um, now there's a dr victor frankl was a famous um, psychologist who was trapped in who was a, being a jew was trapped in the holocaust uh, in auschwitz and other places and when he was trapped he was almost on the he was living on the border of birth and death and in human conditions at that time he lived by focusing meditating on the purpose of life and when he eventually survived and came out he wrote a book called man's search for meaning and in that book he explained how by 
meditating on that purpose he was able to get strength and then he inspired people to discover the purpose of their lives and he also acknowledges the the, the great wisdom texts of the world can help one to find a deeper purpose to one's life so spirituality helps us to understand that we have a purpose that is not defeated even by death you know we are indestructible beings especially the vedantic model of spirituality what does it tell us that we are souls and just as, as i mentioned the soul can come out of the body to near the experiences similarly after that the soul leaves the body and the soul continues to live and the soul lives 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 till the soul attains perfection till the soul attains eternal life with god and there there is no frustration there is no unhappiness there is everlasting joy and that is life supreme success so when one understand that big purpose to life uh, 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 suppose if i am going back car and i know that a friend whom i love very much is there at my destination waiting to meet me or if i know somebody is going to give me 25 kgs of gold over there if i know something precious is there then even if the road is very bumpy hmm, even if my car breaks down and i have to have a lot of inconvenience to get the car repaired still because there is such a shining purpose to my life i will keep persevering so i'll tolerate all the obstacles that will come and move on similarly basically medicine involves what medicine involves not just treating the patient that is important but also giving the will for the patient to be treated and to be healed if the patient is demoralized the patient doesn't have a purpose to live now the op- often in you know, the doctors strive to treat and heal the patient and sometimes the patients are so demoralized they do the opposite they take some pills which kill them they commit suicide so now what suicide is the result is the most uh, tragic and drastic expression of purposeless living how purposeless living can lead to the end of living can lead to destruction of life voluntarily in the form of suicide so purpose can lack of purpose can harm a person so much and purpose can bring a person back from the verge of death or can bring the purpose back from within the midst of a terrible disease back to health and joy and this is the purpose that spirituality can offer us so now somebody may say all this is non scientific mumbo jumbo uh, you know who knows about the soul and all these things why bother we will just focus on treating patients by giving medicines yes treating patients by giving medicines is precise medicines uh, state of the art uh, treatment that is all very important but here we have a quote of a nobel laureate um, scientist sir peter medwar advised to a young scientist his gist of his quote is basically be open to learning from all sources so what does he say there is no quicker way for a scientist to bring discredit upon himself and upon his profession then roundly to declare particularly when no declaration of any kind is called for that science knows or soon will know the answer to all questions worth asking and that questions which do not admit a scientific answer are in some way non questions or pseudo questions that only simpletons ask and only the gullible profess to be able to answer that means he's saying that uh, mm, there are questions which science answers and there are questions for which science has no answers and one should not reject those questions which science can't answer as useless as unscientific as valueless no they may be they are they may uh, <coughs> they are not against science they may be about science they are at a different level of understanding and spirituality can offer uh, that uh, to a person So how does spirituality offer that by giving a sense of purpose to living so once you uh, so this will be say that if it's now what is talking about scientists can apply to a doctor can apply to anyone if a doctor says you know, the beliefs is all, all just trash after you die nothing happens now all that will happen if a if a patient has a strong belief the such sort of statements will only make the patient lose respect for the doctor lose respect for the medical system so there's there is no quicker way for a scientist to being discredited upon himself and upon his profession so there so disrespecting uh, the ans the questions 
for which science does not have answers, such as what is the purpose of life, and disrespecting the sources that can give answers to such questions is actually disservice to science. So by being open to knowledge from wherever one can get it, one can actually expand one's own horizons and expand the resources available to assist in the healing process. And this has been the vision of all the great scientists of the world. So for example, here we have Albert Einstein, his famous quote, science without religion is lame, religion without science is blind. So he's saying that both these fields can be brought together for the purpose of all-round well-being of people. Religion uh, and science can be brought together. So science without religion is lame. And they said that you know, oh, a doctor can offer the best medicine. But if the patient does not have a desire to live, does not have a purpose to live, science will not be able to do anything. The doctor will give the best treatment and the first opportunity the patient may end up committing suicide. So now I am not equating religion, uh, lack of religion with suicide, but it has been well documented that uh, irreligious people, or um, atheistic people are more, well, more prone to commit suicide and to suicidal tendencies than religious people. So science without religion is lame. Unless that pers person has a purpose to living, science will not be able to um, sustain the life of that person for very long, as is tragically exemplified in suicide. On the other hand, religion without science is blind. So we, they don't need to reject medicine per se. Yes, there are there is a higher purpose to living. So when I have the purpose to live, I also need the instrument to live, and the instrument is the body. So. Uh, I also need to take care of the body and the bum and I need proper treatment uh, at the level of the body and I can offer treatment to people also at the level of the body and in this way one can actually integrate both and that is the conclusion of our seminar an integrate approach to caring is that let all human energies scientific and spiritual physical and mental be channelized for healing and living so scientific and spiritual means whatever understanding we get from science no, rather than saying that I am a scientist and that person is not scientist we can see we are all at our core human beings and we are all on a journey towards learning and growing so whichever sources of knowledge help us in learning and growing let's be open to them so if science offers us something we accept that if spirituality offers something we accept that also so both can help in help in, in treating patients and helping them so as <coughs> spirituality can offer a why to live and medicine can offer a how to live okay i want to live and then okay you take this treatment get this body the organ heal get the system fixed up and then you'll be able to live so physical and mental so both the aspects they can be integrated and that can bring about uh, healing and not just mm, a deeper, long-lasting healing, but also a more fulfilling, a more productive living for those who are healed. And even for those who are not fallen sick, spirituality can offer a more fulfilling internally in terms of more satisfactory and more productive externally in terms of what one contributes to the world. In this way, spirituality and medicine can be integrated together for the all-round well-being of all human beings. Thank you. Hare Krishna.